frankly think that maybe God could or should be doing a little better job of managing his creation. A common reaction in the immediate aftermath then of horrific superstorms and mass frustration, or mass murders, I should say, is frustration and disappointment with God. Why doesn't God do something is a question that is often asked both by the victims and by the spectators of any tragedy. And here's the apparent dilemma that has turned some people, at least, into religious skeptics. People want to believe that there is a God that they can pray to, and they want to believe that the God that they are praying to is infinite in power and also infinite in his goodness and compassion. But they reason if God is all-powerful, he should be able to stop evil and suffering. And if God is loving and good, he should be willing to stop evil and suffering. And now it's obvious that evil and suffering still persist all over this planet. So could there really be a good and all-powerful God? In other words, some people reason if God is unable to remove evil, then he lacks omnipotence. And if God is able to remove evil, but he doesn't, well, then it seems like he lacks goodness and compassion. And for some people, then, God appears to be either weak or sinister or both. And those of us who believe in the God of the Bible, those of us who believe in the one true God who is almighty and who is good and compassionate, we have quite a challenge that this poses to our faith because at least on the surface, these things don't always seem to add up. How can God be all-powerful and completely good and and, and loving, and, and, and yet the world remains in the mess that it's in? We who follow Jesus don't believe, of course, that God is inept. We don't believe that he is criminally negligent. Many outside the Christian faith, though, do feel that way. They feel that the Christian God is unqualified to run the universe and that he should resign. Some people, in fact, have already fired him. They have declared themselves atheists, and you need to understand that most most atheists are simply angry theists. For the Bible teaches us that every human being down deep is a theist. Every human being down deep knows that there is a God. They have the image of God planted within them, and God has has given sufficient evidence that they know down deep there is a God. And yet the Bible says many people choose to suppress this truth, suppress this evidence, uh, uh, and, and so forth, and so they get angry. They claim they don't believe in God, but really they are angry theists, whether whether they realize it or not. They are simply expressing outrage at the status quo. You need to understand that the two basic tenets of atheism are this. Number one, there is no God. And number two, I hate him. And when you think about it, their response of outrage is very telling. Atheists deny God because they can't reconcile his existence with their sense that life is unfair and the world isn't what it ought to be. But if there is no God, where does their sense of oughtness and rightness and fairness come from? If there is no God, then life is an accident and we are creatures of random chance and concepts like wrongness and unfairness really aren't relevant. If there isn't any God, there is no ultimate meaning or purpose or oughtness to life. We humans are just a bag of chemicals and protoplasm. We are physical matter that ultimately doesn't matter. And if God doesn't exist, then when we all die, that's it. We are dust in the wind. But The fact that we human beings even have a built-in standard of what's good and evil, the fact that we human beings have a notion that things ought to be different, they ought to be better, the fact that we humans feel disappointment and outrage because things aren't the way we think they should be, it all points to the existence of the God who made us and who has placed in our hearts this high standard of what's supposed to be and who has planted within us an undying desire to experience it. So in the wake of Hurricane Sandy and in the wake of the school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, let's look to the Bible this morning and see how God wants us to view and to respond to tragedies such as these. 
First, let's consider the origin of evil. Where did evil and suffering come from in the first place? And I think we must declare from the outset that it's not God's fault. It's ours. The Bible is clear that when God originally created us human beings and the world that we inhabit, everyone and everything was perfectly good. That's how God made it. And then the first human beings messed up. They rebelled against the God who made them, and that rebellion not only polluted them, it spoiled everything around them. G.K. Chesterton was a Christian thinker and writer in the early 20th century, and he was asked by a newspaper editor to submit an essay to the newspaper addressing the question, what's wrong with the world? Well, what Chesterton did was submit a piece of paper to the newspaper office that was headed, What's Wrong with the World? And his essay was two words, I am, signed G.K. Chesterton. He was wanting to make the point that the world in which we live is messed up because we are all messed up. Earth is full of evil and pain and suffering because we earthlings have turned our backs on God. So we can't blame God for the mess we're in. We brought it on ourselves. But the second thing I think we can say about the origin of evil is this. While God didn't create evil, it is true that he created the possibility of it. Evil became a possibility when God gave human beings free will. God gave us the capacity to choose good or evil, to choose right or wrong, to choose God's way or our own way. And so God is responsible for the fact that we have free will, but we humans are responsible for the acts of free will. Now, you might wonder, why, did God, why didn't God give us free will and then stop us if we chose poorly? Well, then that wouldn't be free will, would it? It's impossible even for God to force people to force people to freely choose to do good. Forced freedom is a contradiction. It's an oxymoron, like world championship cubs. <laughs> now, even God, even God cannot give us free will that only allows us to choose what is right and does not permit us to choose what's wrong. That's not true freedom. The only way to prevent the possibility of evil is to eliminate free choice. But without free moral choice, you also eliminate the possibility for people to choose to do moral good. You see, unless hate is possible, real love is not possible. When there's no creature who can blaspheme God, there can be no creature who can truly worship God either. If God were to destroy all evil, he would have destroyed good as well as evil. It would all be neutral. The thing we should observe about the origin of evil is that a world without human freedom would be a world without humans. Free choice is a necessary part of what makes us human beings. Otherwise, we are reduced to mere robots. God could have programmed us like computers so that we automatically love and worship and obey and serve him I remember, you know, this was before computers. I remember my sisters had, had uh, dolls when they were growing up. We were growing up. One of them was called Chatty Cathy. It was an amazing invention back then because you could pull the string. And you pull the string and the doll would say, I love you, I love you. God could have made us that way. He could have made us, you know, just programmed us. And when he pulls the string, we, we say, I love you, God. Uh, but that's not much of a world. We're forced to do what God wants, and this world is just a puppet stage, and we're artificial characters in a puppet play, and we're only doing things because God is pulling our strings. Only in a world where God can choose to, or excuse me, where people can choose to do evil, can people also choose to be virtuous and compassionate and courageous. Now, some of us might be tempted to think that God giving us free will and creating the possibility of evil was just way too big of a risk. God shouldn't have taken that risk. And you have the freedom, of course, to disagree with God about whether he should have done that, but I simply want to remind you that your arms are way too short to box with God. Well, then if God thought it best to create a world where evil could be a problem, the question becomes, now that evil has become a problem, does God have a solution? What's the best way for God to solve the problem of evil? Let's consider for a few moments some of the options God might have at his disposal for stepping in and solving the problem of evil. One is that God could just destroy us. 
I don't like that option, but it's one that God has. He's all-powerful, and so he's perfectly capable of wiping out the human race. We, we deserve it. If there weren't any people, then, of course, no one would get hurt anymore, and no one would hurt anyone. And nature could spew volcanic blasts and rattle the earth with quakes and flood the seacoast with hurricanes, and the only life forms left to be affected would be plants and animals. Human pain and evil and suffering would cease. That's the good news. But the bad news, it would be because human beings are deceased. Here's another possible scenario for God. He could just handpick all the evil people and eliminate them. God could find all the murderers and the rapists and the child abusers and the political dictators, the despots, and because he's God, he can see who's going to do that as well, and he could just terminate them uh, as well, and, 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 and then, you know, the rest of us could just live here in peace. Oh, really? Don't forget that the Bible reminds us that we all have a wicked heart, that we all fall way short, way short of God's standard. And if God started wiping out evil by sifting through the human population, where would be the right place to stop? Where would be the fair place for him to stop? God doesn't grade on a curve, and we all fail the evil test. If God wiped out evil, I'd be gone. And you would be too, because we all have evil in our heart. We're all part of the problem. Well, how about this solution? God could step in and override every evil act. When someone shoots another person, God could immediately turn the bullet to jello. And the victim who gets shot would just get up and grin and go on with life. And if you accidentally drove off a cliff, God could quickly turn your car and the rocky floor of the canyon into foam rubber, and you would bounce a bit, and you'd walk away a bit dazed for a minute or two, but then you'd shake it off, essentially unharmed. In a world like that, people would be, uh, well, they'd be like Superman or like Bill Murray in the movie Groundhog's Day, unable to be hurt or to die. But this would be a world of recklessness and irresponsibility where everybody is reduced to a cartoon character. We would be shielded from the most serious consequences of evil, but evil would still remain a problem. Now, there might be other possible solutions that we could come up with, but maybe we ought to let God decide the best way to solve the problem of evil. And here it is. The fact is that God can't destroy evil without destroying humans and freedom. But the Bible reveals how God, who cannot mistakes, has determined to solve the problem. He's not going to destroy evil, but he is going to defeat it. And he will. Evil and suffering are temporary and will someday be completely overcome by God. A good and compassionate and all-powerful God will not allow evil and suffering to persist forever. Part of the problem of that setup that we had earlier is that, you know, that a good God should be willing to stop it and an all-powerful God should be able to stop it, uh, but it hasn't. You know, the other guy said, is it hasn't, so since it hasn't, God can't do that. Well, our problem is impatience. God has gone on record to say that he will stop it. And he just hasn't done it yet. We'll talk about why in a moment, but we need to understand that God says that this world's going to turn out okay. It's going to be restored to its original perfection. It's going to get back to the way it was supposed to be. God is going to destroy all evil someday. The message of the last book of the Bible is that God isn't finished yet. And the book of Revelation, I'm so glad that book's in the Bible because it previews the outcome for us. It tells us how it's all going to end. Our good and all-powerful God will completely defeat evil someday. God will definitely win in the end, and evil will definitely lose. Now, Revelation 21 gives us an exciting and encouraging glimpse of what this uh, evil and suffering world will have no more of when God has won the final victory. Uh, That phrase, no more, occurs several times in the book of Revelation because as God's trying to describe what the world will be like after he takes care of everything and defeats evil, it's hard for our puny minds to understand. So he helps us relate to it just in terms of, okay, you know all the bad and sad stuff that's here now? No more of that. As as, as I was uh, thinking of that this week in this passage where he talks about no more, uh, I, I was reminded that the first sermon I ever preached in my life was from this passage, and it was entitled, Heaven's No More's. I I, I preached it when I was in eighth grade because my youth pastor gave me that assignment in a church service that was about heaven, and my responsibility was to preach about heaven's no mores. 
Oh, you should have heard it. It was a masterpiece. <laughs> now, in fact, I think my heavens no more uh, message was, as I was going along, everybody out there was going, no more, no more, <laughs> no more. But here's what the Bible says about the no mores. If we, have, if we belong to God's people, have faith in Christ, and God has already taken care of our problem of evil, through Christ and has forgiven our sin, then we will be there in the end and he will wipe away every tear and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Can you imagine a world like that where you never experienced any sorrow, anything sad, nothing ever bad happened, so there's nothing to cry about. Oh, there might be tears of joy, but I think the Bible here is talking about we'll never cry again when we're in heaven because something upsets us or is sad. We, we won't ever die. We won't ever mourn, therefore. All these bad things are gone forever, and the one sitting on the throne says, look, I am making everything new. This is what I believe, folks. I don't know about you. This is what Village Church believes, that in this messed up world that seems so hopeless, there is hope. God is going to win in the end. You talk to people all the time. They don't have any faith. They don't have any God. I can't answer everything about my understanding of why the world the way it is and why God allows it to continue. But man, I sure like my worldview that there is a God who's going to fix it in the end as opposed to thinking that it's all up for grabs and there's no rhyme or reason and you just try to do the best you can until you die and then that's it. I don't have all the answers, but I sure like what I have compared to what most people have in the world. Because I can envision a world where there will be no more wars, no more terrorism, no more fatal accidents, no more cancer, no more school shootings, no more funerals. We're talking about a world where, where, where God will wipe away all tears, and that's the world that we're waiting for, and it will eventually arrive. God guarantees it. Meanwhile, you say, well, what, what about all this stuff that's happening? Well, you know what? God is keeping track of it all. Uh, you know, I, I, God is so omniscient and powerful that he doesn't need notepads or, or a computer to keep all this, but God notices and sees everything in the world. Nothing escapes his notice. You're looking around at stuff in the world and say, boy, those people are getting away with, they're not getting away with anything. Maybe in this life, in an earthly court they are or whatever, but God's keeping track of it all. He knows everything that's happening down here, and someday God's going to balance the books Someday God is going to punish all evil. He's going to reward all good. He's going to vindicate those who suffer. He's going to compensate for all the pain. Heaven and hell exist in part to set the record straight and to get everything back in order that's happened here on earth. And there will be a day when people who have chosen to follow God and have embraced faith in Jesus Christ and allowed Jesus to take care of their problem of evil, they will be there in the end in a world where there will be no more evil because God will have quarantined, will have permanently removed all evil and those who choose not to follow God into a place called hell so that they can't mess up God's good and perfect heaven on earth forever and ever. Bad will be gone for good. But we've got to remember that the story of world history isn't done yet. And criticizing God for not yet defeating evil is like reading half a novel and criticizing the author because he hasn't yet resolved the plot. I mean, God, we're in the middle of the story. And so we can't accuse God of being out of control. He's unfolding the story in his way and in his time. Now, if you're like me, you'd like him to hurry it up a little. You'd like the book to be a little bit shorter. But if God has already determined to defeat evil and the storyline is set, why, why doesn't he finish it now? What's God waiting for? That's the question. And again, the Bible has the answer. He's going to fix everything in the end, but in the meantime, there is a positive purpose in our present suffering. God, God isn't wasting this. He's not just tolerating this until he fixes it. He's using it right now. He uses pain and suffering in our lives in particular as Christians to develop our faith, to deepen our character, to enhance our ability to minister to other people, and to strengthen our witness with the outside world who needs the hope and the perspective that we have. And if people aren't yet Christians, God is still using pain and suffering as a megaphone to rouse this deaf world to realize their need. God uses pain and suffering as a spiritual wake-up call to draw people to God before it's too late. 
God always uses bad things that happen for good. No verse in the Bible communicates this truth better than Romans 8, 28, where the Apostle Paul declares, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, the next verse, right after Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 29, explicitly states what is God's purpose for our lives. And, and uh, God's purpose for our lives, according to that verse, is to become more and more like Jesus. And so the good that God is trying to work together in our lives through the bad stuff that happens is so that we can be molded in our character and in our conduct to become more like Jesus Christ. Romans 8.28 is not saying that bad things in life really aren't all that bad. It's not saying that bad things in life are really good things. No, the bad things that happen in this world and happen to us are bad. But God causes them to work for our good. Now, we've got to be careful here because we might be t- tempted to define the word good in a physical or material term, as if it's only this life that we're thinking about. Some Christians, I think, have misconstrued and misused Romans 8, 28 by doing just that. They think that the verse is promising that when bad things happen to us physically or materially, God will somehow compensate us physically and materially. That is, he'll make up for our loss by giving us something better. And you'll hear people say, we didn't get the house we wanted, but that's because God has an even better house in mind for us. Or I didn't get the job I wanted, but that doesn't mean, that, but that must mean God is going to provide an even better job for me. Or that guy or girl I thought I would marry broke up with me, but evidently God has an even better life partner for me out there somewhere. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe that sometimes those statements can be true that there may be times in our lives when God does indeed close one door and open another so that it turns out better for us in this life. But that's not what Romans 8.28 is promising. That's not what that's talking about. It's not saying that God will see to it that life here and now will always be enjoyable and prosperous and comfortable for us. No, God isn't nearly as concerned about helping us live the good life physically and materially as he is doing what he can to help us live a good life spiritually and eternally. In other words, God's made agenda for your life and mine doesn't have anything to do with being comfortable. It has to do with making us more Christ-like. Notice also that this verse reminds us that God's master plan for our lives combines and incorporates each and every detail. God causes everything to work together for our good. Uh, There's no event, there's no circumstantial detail of your life or mine that God can't use. We look at some things and we say, oh, God couldn't possibly bring any good out of that. Well, maybe God's not going to bring good simply out of that, but he's going to combine it with some other things. God causes all things to work together for our good. You know, through the years, one of the things that's, two of the things that amazed me, and I don't know which one has amazed me more, one of the things that amazed me is that a 747 jumbo jet can actually get off the ground and fly. And the other thing that amazes me is that an aircraft carrier or a cruise ship can actually stay on top of the water and not sink. But let's think a little bit about a boat, a huge boat, such as an aircraft carrier or cruise ship. If you take a single part of that big ship, like take one of the big steel plates off the hull, or if you take the huge rudder, and you throw that into the ocean by itself, it's going to sink. But when the shipbuilders are finished, and when all the individual parts of the massive steel ship are put together, it floats. And likewise, God can take all the details of our heavy lives, things which in and of themselves seem unsalvageable, and God can build it and work it together with seemingly other unusable events in our lives, and he can end up shaping it into a vessel that is eternally unsinkable. There's some events in my life that in themselves may seem pointless, I can't imagine or see how a good God can work in it, but just because I can't see it doesn't mean that God doesn't have a good reason why he allowed it to happen. You know, with time and perspective, most of us can see good reasons for at least some of the hard things and the tragedy in our lives. We can see some of the good. So where do we get this idea that since we can't see good in everything and all of it, that there must not be? Maybe if we had God's vantage point, we would conclude that not only is some of the things that happen to us working for our good, but all of it is, or God wouldn't have allowed it. 
know, one other thing to notice in Romans 8, 28 is it doesn't say we know how God works everything together for good. It says we know that God is able to bring good even out of evil. And this means we got to trust God. we got to trust in his wisdom. I am not suggesting today that I've got it all figured out, and I know why everything happens in my life or in the world. Far from it. If people say, well, how do you explain this? My answer is probably going to be faith, that I'm a puny guy that doesn't understand these things because I have limited perspective, but if I serve a God who is all wise and he's got a master plan and a purpose, and if I could see things from his perspective, I go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Apostle Paul reminds us in the same book of Romans how great God's riches of wisdom and knowledge are, how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. I can't track with God. Often it seems to me that God is harming us, when in reality, from his perspective, he's hurting us, he's using hurts to help us. Every parent who's taken a child to the doctor to get a shot understands that. Imagine a bear in a trap and a hunter who out of sympathy wants to liberate the bear and he tries to win the bear's confidence. I don't know how you do that, but he can't do it, so he has to shoot the bear full of drugs. The bear, however, thinks that this is an attack and the hunter's trying to kill him. He doesn't realize that this is being done out of compassion. And then in order to get the bear out of the trap, the hunter has to inflict more pain. He has to push him further into the trap to release the tension on the spring. And if the bear is still semi-conscious at this point after being shot full of drugs, he'd even be more convinced that this hunter is his enemy who's out to cause him great pain and suffering. But we know that the bear is wrong. He reaches the incorrect conclusion because he's not a human being, and he can't see things from the hunter's perspective. The hunter is hurting him in order to help him. Likewise, there are times when it appears to us that God is trying to harm us, but instead God in his love is actually allowing us to hurt in order to help us. We don't like it. I'm not saying we should like it, but we can trust him. We can't comprehend why he's doing it and why he's, what he, he's, doing, any, why, why he's doing what he's doing any more than a bear can understand the motivations of the hunter. And God is so wise that he always sees the best possible way to the best possible goal and no pain and suffering that he allows or inflicts in our lives is without a good and loving purpose. God forgive us for thinking that we are as wise as he is or even thinking that we're wiser than he is and that we could do a better job than God does in running the universe. Sometimes we fantasize about what it would be like to be God, even just for a day. So this insightful quote that you've read now already, I'm sure you see it before you, from J.L. Mohn Sabri, provides, I think, a necessary caution. And I love this quote. It helps me a lot in terms of grappling with this issue of trying to make sense of tragedies. He says, if God would concede to me his omnipotence for 24 hours, you would see all the changes I would make in the world. If I had the power of God, oh, there'd be a lot of things I'd do differently than he would. But if he gave me his wisdom too, I would leave things as they are. If we had God's wisdom and saw things from God's perspective, we'd stop questioning God. We'd see the beauty of his master plan, and we would leave things just as they are. When it comes to the problem of evil, what we need more than anything, according to the Bible, is hope. And and the reason is that is because real hope, biblical hope, teaches us to be patient. In fact, if you want a definition of hope from a biblical perspective, at least the verb hope, how do you do hope? The way you do hope is to wait patiently. You know, we're just like people in Bible times. We ask the Lord the question, how long, O Lord? When will you finally defeat evil and stop the suffering once for all? We experience pain and we watch all the suffering in the world and we ask the Lord, how much longer are we gonna have to wait? But the Bible reminds us that hopeful people can and do wait patiently because they remember that the temporary pain that we experience in this life is going to pale in comparison to the eternal gain. Again, it's the book of Romans reminds us that hopeful people can afford to wait patiently because a happy ending is certain. The Bible says if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. If the world was perfect already, we wouldn't have to hope. We'd be in it. 
But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, a perfect world, we must wait patiently and confidently. That's the Bible's answer as we grapple with tragedy and the problem of evil. God has it under control. Wait patiently. And what makes no sense in this life will make perfect sense when you get to heaven and look back. How many of you remember when you were in your mother's womb? You remember your prenatal phase? I don't see any hands going up, and I would be worried if I did. <laughs> Let me remind you of what happened in your mother's womb, however many years ago it was. Every gestation day equipped you for earthly life for right now. Your bones solidified, your eyes developed, the umbilical cord transported nutrients to your growing frame. For what reason? That you might remain in the womb your whole life? No, womb time prepared you for earth time. It suited you for your life here and now, your postpartum existence. Now the interesting thing is some prenatal features were entirely unused by you before birth. You grew a nose, but you didn't breathe. Your eyes developed, but you didn't see. Your tongue and your toenails and your crop of hair served no function in your mother's belly, but aren't you glad you have them now? In the same way, certain chapters in this life seem so unnecessary, like nostrils on a preborn. Cancer, Alzheimer's disease, car accidents, unemployment, financial crises, school shootings, hurricanes, holocausts, martyrdom. If we assume that this life exists just for our happiness here and now, then all of these atrocities disqualify it from doing so. But what if the earth is our womb and God is in the process of forming us so that we will experience life to its fullness when we're born into heaven? Might these challenges, severe as they may be, serve to equip us and prepare us for the world to come? Oh, what a difference a long-range perspective makes. Paul puts it this way, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but by faith we walk, seeing the invisible with the eyes of faith to the world that is coming that we're waiting for. I, I'm astounded by Paul's word choice here. Here is a man who lived a very, very hard life. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He was persecuted. He, he, he experienced all sorts of hardships throughout his life, serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he writes, my, my, my troubles are light and momentary. Isn't that amazing? Why did he have that perspective? Well, it's because he had this eternal perspective. I, I've, I've used this illustration before. I thought if I had a big magic marker here that had unlimited ink, I could draw a dot on the platform here right where I'm standing. And then let's say I took that magic marker and out of that dot, I began to draw a line across the rest of this platform to the north and I went out the doors there and across the the driveway into Center Club parking lot, kept drawing it all past uh, 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 Applebee's there, and I crossed Grand Avenue, and then I kept drawing it to the Wisconsin line, and then I kept drawing it all the way up through w Wisconsin, and, and, and then I kept drawing it all the way through Canada, and then I kept drawing it all the way past the Arctic Circle all the way up to the North Pole. One continuous line. That's quite a magic marker, isn't it? Well, what we're saying and what Paul is saying here is this. The dot represents our life here and now on this earth. And the line represents our destiny if we know Christ. We're going to live on a continuous line, which actually will go way past the North Pole. We'll live forever and ever. And the Bible says, don't get all hung up with what happens in the dot. Live in the dot in light of the line that's coming. And so that's why Paul was able to say, my troubles are light and momentary because they all happen in the dot. And I may be here 70 years or so, but no matter how much suffering I experience, when I get into the 300 million years and more of eternity living with God in heaven, this is going to pale in comparison. The, the temporary pain will be nothing compared to the eternal gain. And our problem, of course, and I have this problem too, is I get all hung up with the dot. 
And, 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 and maturity as a Christian is that we live in the dot in light of the line. I pray that God will help us more and more to gain that eternal perspective. It doesn't solve all of the problems or give all the answers to why things happen why they, like, like they do now. I, I don't know, but I'm not God. And there is a God and I'm not him. And so I, I, I just rest and say, God, you know what you're doing. You have a master plan. If I could see things from your perspective, it would make all the difference. And in the meantime, I sure like my view better than the view of the world around us that says there's no rhyme or reason. It just happens. You're only going to be, there's only a dot, there's no line. And you better hope you live 70 or 80 years instead of 10 or 20 or 30 because this is all you have. Because once you're done, you're done. You're dust in the wind. I don't, I I sure don't want to embrace that view. Go with God, folks. Trust God. Would you pray with me? God, I realize that it's really easy for me in the comfort of a warm sanctuary on a January day with my health and with plenty to eat and a home waiting for me when I get back and kids that are healthy and grandkids that are healthy. It's sure easy for me to talk about this in theory. God, the last thing I want is for this to come across today as if we Christians don't really care about or we're oblivious to the great pain that is in the world. Oh, God, we pray for the people that are without a home because of Hurricane Sandy who are grieving the loss of a loved one who died in the storm. We grieve with the parents and the grandparents who lost a little child. God, I can't begin to understand all of that. I pray that you would help us as your people to be compassionate. That's what you call us to in this world, to help people who are hurting, who are struggling. But God, we thank you for the comfort that does come in knowing that this life isn't all there is, that there is hope. And God, I pray today that if there are people here who are struggling with hardships, who are struggling with whether or not they can trust you and whether you exist, I pray, God, that you will help them to understand what the Bible teaches by your Spirit. And I pray that they will see what the alternative is and how hopeless it is. God, we don't know what 2013 is going to hold for our world or for our lives. We take it one day at a time, but I pray, Lord, that each one of us will trust you and be confident as we patiently wait, knowing that even if some intense suffering and pain is coming our way this year, you will be there for us. You will see us through it. You won't waste it. And it will just be a small blip compared to the glory and the happiness we experience someday. Help us to think rightly, we would pray. As we close today, Lord, we simply want to worship you. Our God is greater than any other. We don't understand everything, but we trust you. And we give our worship to you today, Lord, with gladness of heart. And all of the Lord's people say, amen.